Thank you very much for having us. I would like to start off this debate by saying that whatever my collaborator is going to say is wrong in pretty much every way. I object to that, sir, and I find your credibility in question. After all, you work for Equestria Daily, a site known to feature egomaniacs and hacks. We feature you on Equestria Daily. My point exactly. Well then, enough about Sethisto. Let's get to the bottom line. My opponent is wrong about something on one of his videos around three months ago, and I'm not going to bring it up until now. You're wrong. And you're a duty face. Wow, it figures that the Griffin would immediately get aggressive once they're questioned. I, sir, am a hippogriff, and I find your generalization offensive, if still 90% accurate. Potato, potato, you all look the same to me. Hmm, a persuasive argument. Allow me to counter with... <laughs> I, uh, that's not how you do it. Hi, I'm a bag of Vicodin. And I'm standing next to a bag of Vicodin. Tell me that isn't fun to say. And he's Silverquill. And since we've been kicked out of the 2016 analysis elections, we're here instead to give you 10 tips to get into My Little Pony analysis and reviewing. Number one, abandon, abandon all hope. Wait, sorry, that's a typo. Get ready to work. Early on in the fandom, there were only a handful of folks offering their thoughts via the YouTubes. Nowadays, there's an avalanche of analysts, a rain of reviewers, a plethora of pony pundits. And getting noticed is hard. Much like being in a crowded room where everyone is talking. If you want to gain people's attention, you're gonna have to push yourself to stand out. My advice is to first understand what's important to you. Are you a fan of music? Would a critique of the show's musical or even background tunes play to your strengths? What about being a mythology fan? You've got ample choices for both archetypes and legendary creatures. Or maybe you've learned TV tropes inside and out and can point to examples from the show. There's ample people offering their thoughts on episodes as they air, but folks who offer information or insight beyond that help draw the audience's attention. So have a plan that plays to what you enjoy in both the show and other storytelling forms. Number two, get the equipment. Part of getting noticed is being prepared before you even get started. There are some people who have made videos with lower quality microphones, but unlike the last two topics we covered, analysis is more dependent on visuals. Sure, you could have a good microphone and know how to use it, but if you don't have any visuals, people will most likely exit out of your video quicker or only listen to it and not pay much attention. Ah, but what if you have lovely visuals and sound like you're recording at the bottom of a well? People will likely mute you just so they can see the birdie pictures. There needs to be a baseline of quality for both. You want your viewers' eyes on your video the entire length, and keeping their attention lies in good equipment, voice delivery, and visuals. Here are a list of video programs. Figure out how to get them or save up. Here are a list of microphones that work for analysis. If you want, you might need to commission some vectors of your OC if you want to do the classic analysis setup. Here's what I use for my videos, and here's what Silverquill uses. Take note of his effects, tone, and length of his videos. Don't be afraid to borrow some of his choices. If you have a good setup, you're halfway there. Number three, figure out how to present yourself. The popular format is to have an OC stand in talking while show clips play. However, many reviewers have developed their own style and personalities. Doodle Dabble animates a page of scanned drawings. Strebiskunk narrates over still images but conveys distinct thoughts and views. And while a straightforward presentation might seem the most analytical, folks still want to be entertained. That means putting forth some personality. Some folks like to go the crazy route, the irreverent, or the super serious. You're gonna have to face the challenge of being equal parts commentator and performer. I often follow the presentation style of, how are you still alive? There's any number of personalities online to see how this unfolds. The nostalgia critic, Jim Sterling, the angry video game nerd, SF Debris, Linkara, just to name a handful. But if I can offer one caution, beware the overabundance of attitude. A lot of folks look at online personalities and think it's just people who don't take guff from anybody. At first, that might seem attractive. Folks love a rebel. But what helps sustain these people in the long run is that they often voice support for individuals, projects, and goals. It's not just putting someone else down to make yourself look good. A truly strong presentation comes from a person who demonstrates a passion. Number four, research how to debate and hold a conversation. Early analysis was a victim of this for a few years. The point of analysis is to convey what you think about a subject, even if you might be the only one who thinks so. It's hard to discuss why you like something if I just like it is your response. That's not a very entertaining or insightful response, both to the viewer and other reviewers who might want to collaborate with you in the future. 
The easiest way to practice debate is to be your own devil's advocate, which is someone who believes the opposite just for the purposes of debate. That way you can see what other people would think about a subject, Equestria Girls, Alicorn Twilight, etc., and think of ways to either refute or add on to the disagreement. People like to hear a dialogue, and there have been channels that got popular just because of that, such as Two Best Friends Bitch About Ponies, The Wonder Bronies, and Most Analyst Collaborations. If you can dictate what you want to say well, then you have a leg up on the competition. Eliminate all uses of just and uh and any pauses in your script. Do not waste a single word. Shakespeare once said that brevity is the soul of wit. If your video is below 15 minutes and it's full of entertaining discussions, debates, and devil's advocates, your viewers will stay tuned. Number 5. Consider humor as a way to provoke thought. Like George Carlin said, no one is ever more himself, herself, than when they really laugh. Their defenses are down. It's very zen-like, that moment. Humor is more than just a distraction. It's a way to get people to view a situation in a new light to challenge preconceptions and undermine assumptions. If something in an episode doesn't strike you as working, can you turn that on its ear? Rather than denouncing an aspect of the show, why not share a laugh about it? The benefit to humor is that even if a person doesn't agree, they might still form a connection over laughter. That means that while one idea didn't reach them, others might. Humor is a treacherous path. Given the scope and diversity of the net, it's impossible to avoid offending someone. The real challenge is whether or not you're comfortable making jokes that might upset people. Do you want to go the family-friendly route, or go into risque humor? I'm more a fan of the former, since it allows families to watch my videos without too much concern, though I have danced across the line of decency. Number 6. Research Tropes and Other Media TV Tropes is your friend. Oh yeah, this video was supposed to be longer. As Silver Quill mentioned, TV Tropes is a collection of themes and media choices with a catalog as far back as the internet can remember. If you can begin to understand how different pieces of media convey similar themes, then it becomes easier to discuss more dense topics in your videos. Not only that, but a working knowledge of tropes helps you make your videos more entertaining if you want to invoke them. A certain someone in this video has his own TV Tropes page, and if you read more and more, you begin to see his comedic style and conveyance choices. How he says something is just as important as what he says. Pop quiz. What's one episode of a popular show that you can compare Lesson Zero to? Leave it in the comments. Number 7. Collaborate. This is probably the most contested part of reviews. Some folks think that collaborations don't serve a purpose, and others love the crossover aspect. Like Viking. What did you call me? You heard what I said. Like Viking mentioned earlier, a debate between differing viewpoints can get folks thinking and add some diversity to a video. Plus, if you can blend creative personalities on a project, you can create a really memorable piece. One of the first review videos that really drew the fandom's attention was Anthony C. and Tommy Oliver talking about a Canterlot wedding. But I want to stress this. Collabs are the big guns. The really standout pieces that are meant to highlight both contributors. So I'd urge people not to simply collab because you both like the latest episode. That can become a reinforcement of one view rather than diversity. Pick a topic that has meaning for both, even if you disagree. Character discussions are a great topic for collaborations, or debates over what the show is trying to convey. One of the biggest errors I see people make is saying, I've never done a video before, but I'd like to debut in a collab with you. My advice, have at least three videos of your own finished and posted. Let other people see your work and understand your style before asking them to work with you. Otherwise, you're asking people to take too great a leap of faith, and you're relying on someone else to get you started. Number 8. Don't only do analysis. Analysis is really fun to do and it can keep you busy if you're starting after you see this video, but like with all reviewing, the content sometimes runs out. While there are events within the fandom that you could occupy yourself with, along with the comics and fan content, I'd recommend doing something alongside analysis, just because it's a very thought-provoking job. You have to dictate and prepare for dissent and spend hours upon hours editing your video to make sure that it's funny or insightful. Not everyone can do that week after week, especially when the view count might drop during the hiatus. Both Silverquill and I do other content on the side, although most people go to us for our analysis, and that's okay. Differentiating what you do can help burnout, especially since this is the content where you will get the most pushback. It's easy for people to disagree with your analysis, but it's harder for others to insult your fanfiction readings on any noticeable merit. Plus, maybe you want to do something else instead of analysis. That's okay too. The beauty of this fandom is how big it is and how many people are willing to follow your works if they like you. Focus on having fun and everything else will fall into line. Number 9. Beware the comment section. Stunning revelation, the internet is a harsh place. For every one point you make, ten people will want to make a counterargument, not all of whom are willing to craft a message. They can be blunt, rude, or condescending. 
More often than not, it's a jab against the creator rather than the thoughts they express. Phrases like, This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Do you even watch the show? And the classic internet theme of, Go kill yourself, you f f f f f f f f What about when they call you a d That doesn't sound physically possible. Pray you never find out. Now thank goodness there are just as many people who aren't sociopaths. There's a lot of positivity to be found when people are just enjoying your work. Sadly, we have a tendency to focus on the negative, and too much of that close together can undermine enthusiasm or confidence. I enjoy reading over the comments in my videos, but I try not to get too invested in counterarguments, because that saps time and energy from the next video. There's no clear path for this challenge. It's a test to accept criticism and insight where it can be found, let go of personal slights, and recognize the support. That takes practice, and if you need to step away from the comments to clear your thoughts, please do so. Plus, who reads the comments anyway? Oh, y you, you little Hey, 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 speaking of positivity, let's not talk about that thing you're about to say and instead focus on... Number 10. Having fun and always improving. In the world of content creation, you have to be sharp to continue growing. Notice trends that your genre is taking, such as what everyone is reviewing while also staying relevant. Not many people like to look at review videos two weeks after the episode has dropped, and squiggles on paper is not going to get much attention. If you're dedicated to improving your analysis, visuals, and equipment, then you'll go from a nobody to Silverquill before you know it. Research other analysts and figure out what makes them tick. Research your own style and figure out how to make it better. Read books and watch other content to see how others review or what is conveyed in other shows. There are a myriad of ways to improve with analysis, and watching this video is the first step. When I started doing analysis, I really wasn't sure that pastel ponies would have me think about characters and writing so much. And I figured I'd be lucky to have 50 subscribers and even be a blip on the radar. The support and enthusiasm people have shown is incredible and humbling. And yet my ego, it grows. And yet, after all this time, your videos still aren't good. I gotta remind Seth to stop posting them. Once more, unto the breach. Hey guys, I want to give a special thanks to Silverquill for participating in this collaboration to help all you aspiring analysts. Make sure to subscribe to his channel if you haven't already, and let us know any tips that you've acquired from watching your favorite analysts or doing your own videos. Good luck to you all, and remember that half the fun lies in the journey. See you online, and thanks for watching.